Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen of YouTube and Chucky2009 and tonight we're going to be making a highly requested video that people have been asking about for years now probably on how to weld up a gap when you somehow inevitably come across one in your welding endeavors. So before we get started there's just two things I'd like to get across before we begin. Uh, the first and main one being that it's not okay to watch this video and then go out in your garage or whatever and be like, oh, you know, I, yeah, that mark is like a half inch off from where the blade's going to go down, but Chucky showed me I could just, you know, stick some. <laughs> no, 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 no. That is definitely not why we're making this video. You know, at the end of the day, it's never okay to be intentionally sloppy. It's never okay to be hackish or do subpar work or just be unprofessional and straight up not care. Uh, more importantly than that, it's going to be a lot faster, as I'm sure a lot of you folks have already learned, or if not, will soon learn. It's, it's always faster to do something right the first time than it is to do something wrong, then fix it, then as often as not end up doing it right, you know, from square one all over again. And even more importantly than trying to look professional and do your best is that if you take a joint that was not well fit up at all, it's not going to be nearly as strong in most cases as a comparable joint that was properly fit up and then welded. And so, you know, you might be better off just biting the bullet and starting over a lot of times. For instance, if you're working on like a trailer or something that's a critical project and you got a nice half inch gap in your piece of angle iron that you're running as a cross member or whatever, you're like, oh, that's all right, I'll just watch this YouTube video here and try what this guy said to do. Uh, you know, you can definitely weld it up, don't get me wrong, so we've all heard that if you can jump it, you can weld it, and if you haven't heard that, then boys and girls, those are words to live by. I mean, no they're not, no they're definitely not. Uh, you know, and then you, you weld it, and you load your trailer down, you get out on the road, and it falls apart and kills someone, uh, you know, then it definitely was not worth saving like 30, 40 bucks on a piece of angle and some time, so, you know, Definitely try to do things right the first time. Uh, definitely don't do use any of these techniques on anything critical. And uh, with that being said, only use this stuff in like non-critical projects or you know anything along those lines. If you're if you're new to welding and you know you screw something up, which is really easy to do, and you're just making a cart for your welder or whatever, yeah, it'll probably be fine. But always use your best judgment. Never do this on anything critical. And let's get started. All right, now I'm going to be welding on some eighth inch mild steel and I'm going to be stick welding this just to kind of make it as hard as possible and thus best for demonstration's sake. Now this is the first method. As you can see, we've got about an eighth inch gap here. Actually, I think that vertical piece is about 10 gauge or so. But we got a little bit of a gap here and I'm going to try and just wedge this random piece of scrap metal in behind it. Now the problem with this is that it doesn't actually fill the gap because, um, you know, it's behind the gap. It's, it's not wedged in there. And so when I'm welding this, it's kind of awkward and all that slag keeps running ahead of the puddle into that void and kind of snuffing out the arc like what just happened. And I'm getting all sorts of undercut. This is really hard to control. It's not welding well at all because we're just stacking metal on top of itself and it's just, well, this is what we got. I mean, I guess it kind of sort of looks all right, but, you know, the other problem with this technique is that instead of joining our workpiece to our other workpiece, we're joining our workpiece to a piece of scrap metal, which is then kind of attached to the other piece, and so that's not really good. I gave it another pass and it does look quite a bit better with that on top of it, but again, you know, this isn't really ideal. So this method is one of my favorite methods of what we're going to be demonstrating here. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take a joint made of slightly thicker material and just put a piece of round stock in the gap to kind of fill that in. Now the closer you can get that round stock to fitting perfectly in the gap, the better results you're going to have. Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of debating here on if I want to put it on the back of the material or the front of the material. I end up putting it on the front of the material just like this. And uh, yeah, so the closer in there this fits, the better. But the problem with that is, again, just like the first time, you know, you're not actually joining workpiece A to workpiece B. You're joining, you know, both of them to this little piece of scrap metal, and then it's kind of fused into both sides, so it's not ideal. So what's going on here, the next problem we're having is, as you can see, this is a really tall, you know, convex puddle, and the reason for that is because we're welding a lot more metal than uh, than we would be doing without this piece of round stock here, and so I just turn up the amperage to compensate for that, but then we'd be running way too hot for the material that we're using. And uh, this is what we're left with. We'll just go ahead and knock the, uh, the slag off of here. Yeah, as you can see, it's, uh, it's really tall. It's really convex. It's really ugly. We've got, um, you know, it's uh, lack of fusion along the bottom toe line, probably along that top toe line as well. 
but it, again, if you can get the piece of scrap metal to fit perfectly in the gap, you know, that'll sort of minimize this problem. Uh, the other problem is the backside, which you can see here. Uh, as you can see, you can still see the uh, the sharp edges at the top of the, uh, the vertical member, and that's not a good thing because it means that that's not at all fused in. And it looks like not only that, but if you look into the joint, you can actually see almost to the front, which tells us we barely penetrated into that material at all. So if I was going to use this method, I'd want to get that piece of round stock to fit in as good as possible, and then I'd want to weld it from both sides and hope for the best. It's not ideal, but if properly done, it's probably one of the best methods here. So this is much like what we just did. As you can see, I got my round stock again, and we're just gonna kind of fit this in here now. It, it does fit a lot better into this joint than it did in the last joint. And as you can see, I'm just, uh, I got it set up, and I'm essentially just gonna run all this over with my stick electrode. Problem is that, you know, much like previously where we didn't have enough heat to adequately melt things, now we have kind of too much. And as you'll see, I'm about to burn through here. It's getting out of control. Get up, there it went. Yeah, I'm trying to patch back up with the uh, with the rod and nothing's happening. So I'm just gonna replay that again. So this technique is, in a lot of cases, gonna be really slow. Um, it's still not that great, but in terms of quality and structural soundness, this is probably gonna be one of, if not the uh, the best methods, at least of what we've talked about so far in this video. I mean, we do have a decent weld in there, kind of, even though we have a gap, and the gap is going to kind of weaken things if there's a lot of stress placed on this joint, so for the millionth time, this isn't, this isn't really ideal. However, when I have to weld up a gap in something, and I can't just, like, TIG weld it or something, then uh, I try to take a piece of round stock and get it to fit in there right, and then just weld it up. Now, this next technique is actually an excerpt from the uh, Ultimate Welding Table build. I, you know, I demonstrated this in there. Didn't really feel the need to recreate the uh, situation. But this is called Texas TIG. Essentially, I'm just stick welding over a gap, and I got a piece of TIG wire stuck in there, and uh, we're just welding it all together, and a piece of TIG wire kind of just acts to fill up the uh, the gap, much like the round stock just did, but a little bit differently. Now, some folks like to use a TIG wire. Other people like to use a stick electrode with the flux knocked off, but regardless, basically all you do is you just uh, lay it in there and weld it up. Now, as you can see, this is a joint that will have some weight on it, being that it's part of a pretty heavy-duty welding table, but it's not, you know, what I'd consider critical, and this is a finished weld, and I gotta say, I think it turned out really well. But TIG is an excellent, excellent, excellent process for dealing with a gap or bad fit up or anything simply because of the sheer amount of control you have and with a unit like this the adjustability you know of even the tiniest little parameters of your weld that you can kind of dial in and, and use to your advantage when you're working on a problem like this the other thing is short circuit mig uh you know <laughs> buddy of mine once said you could short circuit mig weld up just about any gap uh, that doesn't really offer as much control and it's a much cooler puddle than you get when you're tig welding at least in my opinion so it may or may not be quite as strong or quite as good but that's definitely not a bad way to go for non-critical applications but uh yeah this is the tig welding method all right so we just tried a few different things out and the results let's be honest here sucked <laughs> all of those things had a few similarities for instance everything we did took a lot more time than just doing it right in the first place and they were generally ugly. Some of them looked kind of all right, especially after adding second passes and sort of covering up the mess we made, which, let's face it, really isn't a good idea. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of the reality of working under what I consider to be far less than ideal circumstances. So there's that. Um, the other things, the other pointers that I'd give to someone uh, just to kind of know about this type of thing, is if you're not going to do any of the methods that we just described, because there's a good chance you might not have to. For instance, if you're if you're welding quarter inch plate together with some eighth inch 7018 and 120 or 130 amps, and you only have a gap that's like uh, I don't know, let's say 64th, of, I don't know, not a 64th, a 16th of an inch, you should really, you know, you probably won't have any issues with that whatsoever. You can probably just just weld it out, and uh, that'll be good. Uh, so sometimes you really just have to know and you just have to shut up and weld it and just make it work. The other thing is, you know, you can always work to turn down your amperage. So that's the other problem we had with all this stuff. We're just dumping, dumping heat into these work pieces. Those uh, pieces of flat stock that we put the rod behind, those were visibly bowed. And we only welded like an inch and a half of that mess. So that's another problem you're going to have to face. So I guess to summarize this video, I would say 
The best thing you can do for the millionth time is to just do it right in the first place. If, uh, if something happens and it doesn't come out quite right, my personal favorite method for non-critical things, of course, is to just use the filler rod or, you know, a Texas TIG or use the round stock and place it behind the workpiece so that way it doesn't, you know, totally prevent any kind of fusion of the root of the joint because that's a major problem. Uh, but again, just do it right the first time or if it's a really small gap, just shut up and weld it. Uh, so to speak. The other thing is some processes are going to be a lot better for this than others. For instance, stick welding is definitely one of, if not the hardest to use with this, uh, these skillful techniques. Uh, some of the easier ones would be like MIG and TIG, short circuit MIG of course, and TIG welding because TIG is going to give you a lot of control. You can go uh, slow, you can just kind of stitch things up, maybe build up one side and build up the other side and then just go slow and weld up the two uh, expanded sides. Uh, you can do that with either of those processes. I think it would probably be a little easier with TIG. But again, just do it right the first time or don't expect perfection. Because, you know, even if you make a mess like some of these things we made, if I wanted that to look okay, be like, oh, look at this gap that I welded up. It came out just fine. I could make it look okay, but would it really be okay? No, not, not really, not at all. So again, uh, if you come across situations where there's a little gap and it's a non-critical project. Yeah, there's things you can do that we talked about, but it's not really ideal. But regardless, uh, just keep those things in mind. Mainly the, it's not going to be as strong as it could have been part. And I hope this video helps you out. Use these tips wisely. Use your best judgment. And uh, best of luck in your welding endeavors. Thanks for watching, everybody.